Physicist and cosmologist Professor Lawrence Krauss is recognised as one of the world's leading theoretical scientists, once predicting the presence of dark energy, which has since been confirmed by astronomers. Recently, he's turned his hand to popular science. His most recent work, A Universe from Nothing, is seen by some as the cosmological equivalent of Darwin's On the Origin of Species, while others view it as an attack on religion and the existence of God. God. Professor Krauss is speaking with Darren Osborne. Well, Lawrence Krauss, welcome to One Plus One. It's great to be here. Uh, Albert Einstein was once quoted as saying, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't understand it yourself. Your latest book, A Universe from Nothing, deals with some fairly weighty topics. How would you explain it to a six-year-old that the universe <laughs> came from nothing? Well, I, I, you know, it's funny because six-year-olds are a lot less biased than, than, than adults often. And so the, question, the neat thing is I'd try and tell them that nothing is not exactly what they thought it was. It was a little bit different, that the laws of physics, when you can combine them with, with something called quantum mechanics and relativity, tell you that even empty space is much more interesting than you thought. Empty space is a boiling, bubbling brew of stuff that's popping in and out of existence every second. And... That's an amazing fact, even though you can't see it. And what's more amazing is what we've learned, that if you take all, just a bit of space and get rid of all the particles and all the radiation and everything, that it still weighs something, and we don't understand why. So this, this nothing that you talk about, I mean, this is, this is what existed before the Big Bang? Well, you know, there's different kinds of nothing. And I probably wouldn't tell the six-year-old this, but I'll tell you this, if you don't mind. When one talks about a universe from nothing, there's been a lot of discussion. What, is, what, is, what do I mean by nothing? And the answer is, initially, I don't know what I mean by nothing. Nothing and something are physical quantities. That question, why is there something rather than nothing, has all long been thought to be a religious or philosophical question. But I would claim it's really a scientific one. One can show that if you apply quantum mechanics to gravity itself, even space itself can pop into existence where there was none before. So you can have no space, no time, and suddenly, boom, a universe. I think for most people, that would be a pretty good definition of nothing, but not for everyone, because there's some sticklers who say, you know what, if you can create something from it, it can't be nothing. It could be that even the laws of nature that we measure here on, in our universe are just accidents, that the laws come into existence at the same time the universe does. And in that sense, then, there's no laws, no space, no particles. To me, that's a pretty good definition of nothing. And if you don't like it, I suggest you come up with a better one. Well, most theologians and, and religious people would say that something or some entity or some object of something must have created those laws in the first place. But that's just a lazy... I mean, that, that doesn't explain anything. You say, well, look, I don't know where it came from. I don't know if it's been around forever. How do I... You can always keep asking why, why, why. Where does it stop? Well, I'll invent something called God, and then I, have to, then I can stop asking the question. But... But I'm really interested in ans asking that question by letting the universe tell me, not deciding in advance that I want someone looking after us. I think one of the purposes of science is to take us out of our comfort zone. We get too complacent. We think the whole universe is the way we imagine it to be. And science teaches us that the universe is the way it is whether we like it or not. And we have to bend our mind around the universe rather than the other way around. And to me, that's what makes science worth doing. But the religious people do feel uncomfortable when, when they're confronted with, with uh, new understandings in science such as this. Some people do. <laughs> I mean, you, you had Richard Dawkins write the afterword um, yeah. f for your book. He says towards the end of his afterword, um, if the origin on the origin of species was biology's deadliest blow to supernaturalism, um, we may come to see your book, A Universe from Nothing, as the equivalent for cosmology. Big call. How do you feel about that? Well, I was shocked and I guess I was obviously very honored that he said that comparing it to Origin of the Species. It's a little over the top, uh, but that's okay for me. <laughs> but, but, but in retrospect, without the pretense, I think it's, it's, it, there's something there because you see, before Darwin, life was a, all aspects of life was a miracle and life seemed designed. And what Darwin showed is from simple laws of biology and chemistry in some sense, and natural selection uh, combined with mutation, even though we didn't know about the genes at the time, there was a plausible mechanism for understanding how the entire diversity of life on Earth, which seems so miraculous, arose from a very simple beginning. And in some sense, what cosmology is doing now, and what I tried to describe, is doing the same thing for the universe. I can't prove that the universe doesn't have purpose, or that there was no God, or that it wasn't necessary. But what is amazing is that the laws of physics we've discovered over the last century have made it plausible that this complex, rich, amazing universe came 
from a very simple beginning by just the laws of physics. So in that sense, there's a, there's a, there's a parody, of course, but nevertheless, I mean, I, I don't claim uh, or, Origin of Species was one of the greatest pieces of scientific work in human history, and, and there's no way I, I, I would try and claim uh, parody in that regard. There seems to be a, a growing a, a growing movement within the U.S. in particular in the teaching of intelligent design. Do you, how big a threat do you see it um, in your country and around the world? Well, I think it's a threat because people feel threatened by science, and they shouldn't. And so I've spent a lot of time in the United States, as you may know, fighting to have high school evolution taught in schools, not because, I, not because there's something sacred about evolution or sacred about anything, frankly. It's just... We already do a bad enough job teaching science. I don't want to make it worse. We live in a society, in a world, where all the important challenges of the 21st century depend upon science. From global warming to energy production, these are issues that we have to face with our eyes wide open. And to face them, we have to have an educated public who are, in order, especially in democracies, who can determine, choose public policy or the people who create public policy based on reality. Do you think it's having an impact on things such as um, the understand, public understanding of climate change? Absolutely. There's no doubt. Uh, that and money. I think the, there's a large percentage of people who say, look, you know, God created the earth and created it, our, uh, humans to have dominion over the earth, and don't worry, God will take over the earth. doesn't take care of the earth for us. It doesn't matter what we do. And people have to realize that it does matter what we do. And, and that, so that's one aspect of it. But I also think it's this, it's this fear that scientists have some agenda, some atheist agenda, which we don't have. But I think that fear that scientists have some agenda, which comes from the teaching of evolution, say, creeps in to climatology. And people think scientists have some liberal agenda that they're trying to promote, and therefore it's not trustworthy. And that, that has been promoted in my country tremendously by the application of a lot of money. So most Americans now think climate change is a hoax, and when it, it's actually happening. And so we need to, the only way to combat that kind of nonsense, it seems to me, is with education. And, to, and we have to step back and, and, and explain to people how the universe works. Now, one of the other um, uh, hats that you wear, you wear many, um, is you're on the board of sponsors for the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, and each year we get an update on, on where the doomsday clock is sitting. And in more recent times, climate change seems to be causing the, the clock to tick closer. Does the clock highlight that, as a species, we seem to be more reactionary than... than it, you know, Einstein said, it, it said it, you know, six years ago, he, after the first nuclear explosion, he said, everything has changed, save the way we think. And I think, unfortunately, 66 years later or whatever, it's still the same. We react to immediate crises, but we can't seem to react to problems in the long term. And moreover, we, we have yet to demonstrate that we can act as a global species, that, that we, can, we can obviate the, the, or overcome the local national uh, problems and issues and, and act in concert for the good of the planet. And I'm not convinced we, we ever will. And I, th I suspect, when it comes to climate change, that what we'll find we need to do is react. I don't think we're going to head it off. We may decide to do nothing, but we should do it in an informed way. The public has a right to know what the issues are so that they can make the decision about what they want to sacrifice and not sacrifice for a potentially better future for their children. Lawrence Krauss, thanks for joining us on One Plus One. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.